The title of this presentation is Are We Under the Law or Free from the Law? That's the one million dollar question. I use several sources in this presentation. I usually use the Lexham English Bible because it uses more modern English, so it's easy for me to read it. King James is very tough for me, being English being my second language. I'm also using the Masoretic text for the Old Testament, and I'm, I always use the Septuagint, which is the original Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And I used a few other sources that you might be interested in exploring. Surprise, but several of the Gospels and all the Gospels and Revelation and several other books actually have Hebrew manuscripts. The New Testament, actually many books in the New Testament were written in Hebrew originally, okay? And I believe that we actually uncovered some of the Hebrew transcripts. And you can go to this website, the thehebrewgospels.com, um, and I give links in the presentation. And so for me, it, it's so amazing to read the Gospels in Hebrew. It, and you will see through some of my slides that I'm pointing to some insights that I'm gaining by reading the original Hebrew transcript and comparing it. And you will see, it's very fascinating. I also included a couple of other websites that are, in my opinion, are wonderful websites analyzing Paul's teaching because as all of us know, Paul's is not easy to understand. <laughs> His words could be taken in different direction. So I love these two websites because they give you a, a very methodical analysis of all of his writings and showing you that Paul actually did support following the law. So the common objections that I'm going to address in my presentation, there are a few of them. I asked all of my friends what kind of objections Christians usually have, and this is what I came up with. The first one is, the word commandments in the New Testament refers to just the Ten Commandments. This, the next one, Jesus came to fulfill the law and therefore the law is no longer in effect. The law is Jewish. I love this one. You cannot earn your salvation. Following the law implies that you are trying to earn your salvation. And the last one is, the law is a curse. So in my presentation, I'm going to answer all of these objections. I gathered all of the material in a very analytical, very methodical way. Hopefully you can follow it with me. So let me start with what is the law? Okay, so when you read the Bible and you see the word law, what is it? Okay, law. So the definition of the word Torah is literally instruction. When Jews say Torah, they most likely are referring to the first five books of the Bible, okay? So in Israel, when we say Torah, we mean the first five books. However, when Yah uses the word Torah, he either refers to the entire body of law that he transmitted through Moses to the Israelites, including the Ger, the foreigners among them, or to a subset of instructions per a specific topic. For example, in Exodus 12:49, one law, okay, so in English it shows as the word law, but in Hebrew the word is Torah. Okay, so whenever you see law, always translate it to Torah. Okay, so one Torah will be for the native and for the alien who is dwelling in your midst. Exodus 6, 28, and Yahweh said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commands and my Torahs? Here he is using plural, okay? In Leviticus, then Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his son saying, this is the Torah of the burnt offering. In Leviticus 7.11, he says, this is the Torah of the fellowship offerings. In Leviticus 14.2, he says, this is the Torah of the leper. 
and then in Deuteronomy 4.44, now this is the Torah that Moses said before the Israelites. So you can see that the Torah can imply the entire body of law or a specific set of instructions per sacrifice, a type of sacrifice, or per type of disease. And so the word law in English translations refer to the word Torah. Now, I want to show you, I did a short exercise here on Deuteronomy 4, the first eight verses of Deuteronomy 4, 4. just to show you, I know it's small letters, but I color code the words, and I went to different translations, and I saw how different translations have different words, and I just want to show you how many words are used in the English translation to basically I just refer to the law, okay, to the components of the law. So it says, now Israel, listen to the rules. In other, in some places it says statute. And to the regulations or ordinances that I'm teaching you to do in order that you may live and you may go in and you may take possession of the land of Yahweh, the God of your ancestor is giving to you. Then you must not add to the word. Now he's calling it the word okay, that I'm commanding you, and you shall not take away from it in order to keep the commands or commandments in some other translation of Yahweh your God that I'm commanding you to observe. Then he says, but you, the ones who are, okay, okay, I'm jumping to five. See, I now teach you rules, statutes, regulations, ordinances, then again in verse 6 he's using rules and steady you can see like he's just like interchangeably uses so many different words to describe his law in verse 8, 8 he said and what other great nation has for it just rules regulation just like this whole law whole Torah that I'm setting before you today so it's really important I'm really picky about the Hebrew because the Hebrew gives you basically what you're looking for the English can only confuse and make you think that one word can mean only just a subset the law defined as I said the Torah literally means instruction there are a few words that are used interchangeably by Yah to denote components of the law. And here you see the rule that use law. In Hebrew, it's called chukim, and it basically means laws of the Torah. Regulation, judgment, ordinances. In Hebrew, it's mishpatim. It means regulations or judgments of the Torah. Words or saying, it's dvarim or dvar in singular, may refer to any and all of the laws, statutes, judgment, regulation, like all of this long list of words, okay? Commands or commandments may refer to any uh, or all of the laws, statutes, judgment, regulation, commands. The entire law composed of all of the above is referred by Yah using two terms. One of them is Torah, like I said before, and the other one is commandment in a singular form. So whenever he say a commandment, he means Torah, okay? And then also many times he referred to everything as word, just one word, like word, okay? Psalm 119 and Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 8 are classic example of how these terms are used interchangeably. So the reason I did this exercise is just to show you how English can be really confusing because there are so many words. And to say that commandments refer to the Ten Commandments is not accurate at all. Number one, the Ten Commandments are not even called Ten Commandments in Hebrew. They are called Ten Words. They are called Ten Words, not Ten Commandments. And the word commandments can be and is interchangeably used with any of the other words. When you hear Ten Command, when you hear the word commandments, you cannot assume that it's only Ten Commandments. The next topic is righteousness versus lawlessness. What is righteousness? There are a few ways to look at it in the Hebrew Bible. So first of all, righteousness is equal to walking with God. 
Yah is righteous, all of his ways are just and righteous. And I quoted here a few verses. For example, Psalms 36, 6. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments like the great deep. You save men and beasts, O Yahweh. So Yah is righteous. John 17, 25. Righteous Father, although the world does not know you, yet I have known you. And these men have come to know that you sent me. Yah is righteous. Walking in Yah's way is also righteous. Noah and his family were saved because they were righteous. In Genesis 7, 1, Then Yahweh said to Noah, Go you and all your household into the ark, for I have seen you are righteous before me in this generation. And then it says in Genesis 6, 8 through 9, it said Noah walked with God. Noah was a righteous man without defect in his generation. Noah walked with God. So Noah walked with God. That was the essence of his righteousness. And that's exactly why he found grace in the eyes of Yah. That grace was a direct result of his conduct and actions. There was someone else before Noah who walked with God. That was Enoch, Noah's great-grandfather. And Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. And then and Enoch walked with God and he was no more for God took him. So we can safely trace back the knowledge of what it means to be righteous and walk with God to at least as far as Enoch in the Bible. Righteousness is walking with God. Walking okay. with God is lawfulness. It's obedience to Yah law. So I gave you a few verses here that show you that when you translate it, actually in English it, show, it says following, but in, in Hebrew it actually says walking. Okay? When you walk in Yah's way, when you walk with God, then you are obedient to His law. Let's look at some of the verses here, Deuteronomy 8, 6. You must keep the commandments of Yahweh, your God, by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. Okay? Deuteronomy 26, 17. Yahweh, you have declared today to be for you as your God and to walk in his ways and to observe his rules and his commandments and his regulation and to listen to his voice. Okay, so righteousness is walking with Yah and walk with, walking with God and walking with God is basically being obedient to him. I, get, I give a lot of references, so I'm, I'll happily send this presentation to all of you if you would like it so you can have all of the references because I literally comped the Bible for each topic and I put all of the references that go with what I'm telling you here. So righteousness is equal to walking with God and it's equal to lawfulness, to obedience with God. So righteousness is defined in the Bible as diligent, diligently observing, following Yah's Torah, basically in other words, being obedient. Ezekiel 18, 5 through 19. And if a man is righteous and does justice and righteousness, and on the mountains he does not eat, and he does not lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, and the wife of his neighbor he does not defile, and he does not approach a woman of menstruation, and he oppresses no one, and he return, returns a pledge for his loan, and he commits no robbery, and he gives his bread to the hand and he covers a naked person with a, a, a garment and he does not charge interest and he takes no usury and he holds back his hand from injustice and he executes a judgment of fairness between person and in my statutes he goes about and my regulation he keeps performing faithfully then he is righteous now I want you to notice something he lists several things Yah is listing here several things that makes a person righteous and notice that some of them are actually included in the ten commandments like not coveting your neighbor's wife and doing stuff with her but he's mentioning things that are not part of the ten commandments let's look at them here so he's saying 
does not approach a woman of menstruation. That's not in the Ten Commandments. It does, it does not oppress, uh, it oppresses no one and return a pledge for his loan. Okay, that's not there. Gives his bread to the hungry and cover a naked person with a garment. It's not in the Ten Commandments. And not charge interest and takes no usury. Hold back his hand from injustice. Execute ju a judgment of fairness. All of these things are not part of the Ten Commandments, but he lists them as this is what makes you righteous. In Hosea, he says, who is wise that he can understand these things? Who is discerning that he knows them? The ways of Yahweh are right, and the righteous walk in them. You walk in them, but transg transgressors stumble in them. You will return and see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. That's in Malachi. So even in Yeshua's day, the parents of John the Baptist were considered righteous because they were walking in the commandments and ordinances of Yah blameless, okay? So you can see in Luke verse, chapter 1, verse 5 to 6, it happens that in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest, Zechariah, by name of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous in the sight of God, living blamelessly in all the commandments and regulation of the Lord. It doesn't say in the Ten Commandments, in all the commandments and regulation of the Lord. And righteousness, walking with God, and obedience to la yeah, laws are all one and the same. Sin is the opposite of righteousness. So if obedience to the law is righteousness, then would not transgression of the law be sin? In Jeremiah, he says, Jeremiah 44, 23, because of the fact that you made smoke offerings and that you sinned against Yahweh and you did not listen to the voice of Yahweh and you have not walked in his Torah and in his statue and in his legal provision, therefore this disaster has happened to you as it is this day. Okay, so sin is the, the opposite of righteousness. In John, in 1 John 3, 4 through 24, I, I'm not going to read all of this, but, but John is very clear. He says, the one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And then he says, the one who practices righteousness is righteous. Then in verse 10 he said, But this, the children of God and the children of the devil are evident. Everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. And the one who keeps his commandments, so now he is, he, in John he's saying righteousness is keeping the commandments. The one who keeps his commandment resides in him. So we can see more examples in Hebrews also. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament in both of them, righteousness and keeping the commandments is one and the same. In Hebrews 10, 26 through 30, and I truly believe that Paul wrote Hebrews because of the style of writing. He says, for if we keep on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire. So once we know the truth, we cannot continue to sin. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. I just want you to remember that sinning is accurate to being of the devil or children of the devil. I want you to remember that term because I'll get, I'll close that circle after showing it to you in a few places. So sin leads to death, righteousness leads to sanctification. Paul was really big on it. On Roma, in Romans 6, 15 through 20, he says, you are slaves to whomever you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness, okay? So 
Paul is putting together obedience and righteousness in acts. But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, you who are full of all deceit and of all unscrupulness, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness. So son of the devil is enemy of righteousness, which means enemy of obedience. Will you not stop making crooked the straight path of the Lord? Again, son of the devil. Let's remember that title. So tying it all together. So Yah is righteous. All of his ways are just and righteous. Yah's word, law, endures forever. Psalms, the beginning of your word is truth and every one of your righteous ordinances endures forever. Everyone forever, yes. And Yeshua agreed when praying, he said to the Father, sanctify them in the truth of your word, in truth. Remember what word is, word is the Torah. Righteousness is defined in the Bible as diligently observing, following Yah's entire Torah. Righteousness is equal walking with Yah, is equal to walking in all Yah's ways, equal to obedience to Yah from the heart. Loving and observing Yah with all your heart and soul is equal to observing all his precepts. So instead of saying commands, statutes, rules, regulation, ordinances, we can just take all of this and call it precept. Okay? So observing all of his precepts, fearing him and listening to his voice, it's equal to residing in Yah. So when we are obedient to him, we are residing in him and we are considered children of God. In case you missed it, righteousness, walking with God and obedience to Yah, Torah are all one and the same. Sin, transgression, is equal unrighteousness, equal lawlessness, okay, as in not observing Yah's precept or law. E equal disobedience to Yah, equal making crooked the straight path of Yah, and when we are in this mode, we are considered children of the devil. So we said that one of the objections is that the law is Jewish, okay? So I'm saying the law is not Jewish. So let's look at it. The term Jewish, or in Hebrew, it's Yehudi. It comes from the word Yehuda, which is Judah, the tribe of Judah, okay? Back to the past, we had the Southern Kingdom, Northern Kingdom, the Northern Kingdom, was exiled and they were lost to history. No one knows where they are and who are their descendants. We can probably make educated and intelligent guesses, but let's say we don't know where they are. And all that was left in Israel was the kingdom of Judah. So when the kingdom of Judah was called Yehuda, so that's where the word Yehudim comes from or Jews, because they are the descendant of their tribe. Okay, and even on that, we have some new information that's, that many of the Jews nowadays are actually not really the descendants of the tribe of Judah, okay? And there is a lot of research on it. I've been reading some of the research and I'm in agreement that actually there is a large portion that they are not descendants of, of Judah. So the term Jewish or Yehudi primarily refers to the descendant of Judah of the 12 tribes of Israel, though it can also refer to other tribes who mixed with Judah, such as Benjamin, Simeon, and Levi. It is true that the Israelites, as in the entire nation of Israel, were given the oracle of Yahweh. It is also true that the Jews, Yehudim, have been keeping it for thousands of years, Although tradition and the Talmud has, pl uh, uh, has placed unnecessary things on top of it. But is the law really Jewish? Some say there is one standard and expectation of obedience for Jews, but a different moral standards for Gentiles. Whether it be the traditional Christian moral standard or only the Noachide laws. And by the way, I can do a whole presentation on the Noachide law, laws. Uh, many people don't realize that most of these laws come from the Talmud. They don't come from the Bible. So just remember it. 
If that is true, then there should be two standards of righteousness in the Bible, a Jewish standard and a Christian righteousness, a Jewish righteousness and a Christian righteousness. But are there really two standards of righteousness in the Bible? So let's look at it. Should we only observe the commandments that modern preachers say are only for Gentiles? Who gets to decide which commandments are Jewish and which ones aren't? Are the Sabbath, the feast days, and the clean and unclean commandments given to Jews and or Israelites only? In the next few slides, I'm just showing you evidence that the law actually existed from the beginning. And there are so many verses in the Bible that support it. The law was given formally to the nation of Israel on Mount Sinai. But it was known by the patriarchs and by the lineage from Adam leading to, to the Mount Sinai revelation. So the first thing that I did is I just wanted to do this short diagram to ask a question. Is it possible to sin if there is no law? Uh, how, how can you be judged if there is no law? So we have to start somewhere. We have to start with some rules and laws. And then we have a free will. And then through free will, we choose, are we going to be obedient to the law, which is righteousness? Or are, are we going to be disobedient, which is sin? And then there is judgment. Judgment always comes with free will, unfortunately. And the judgment is either a blessing if you are righteous or a curse. And laws or ordinances were passed down from generation to de generation and were much more commonly known in those days. Did you know that many timelines show that Noah was alive until Abraham was 65 years of age? Did you know that many timelines show that Adam's son Seth died just 13 years before Noah was born? We also see that Jacob coexisted with Shem, the son of Noah. Thus, it was not so difficult for the standard of righteousness to be passed down. However, when the children of Israel went into Egypt, they went into forced labor, and this commandment, along with many others, was consequently forgotten. So I believe, and I'll show you the verses, that the children of Israel were aware of many laws, especially the law to keep the Shabbat, okay, the seventh day. That law was from day seven of creation. I am proposing that maybe because they went into forced labor, they were slaves. They couldn't do whatever they wanted. So maybe that's how it got lost, at least that law. We mentioned earlier that Enoch walked with God, was obedience, which we already said that walking with God is being obedient to Yah's law. Enoch also testified that righteousness, obedience to Yah's law and justice existed from Adam's day through Enoch's birth. I think this is one of the only places in the presentation that I'm stepping into the Apocrypha and because I, I try to stay within the canonized Bible. But this is just a quote that I brought from Enoch. Uh, first Enoch when he said, and Enoch started speaking from the book and he said, I was born seventh in the first week while there was still righteousness and justice. What does it mean there was still righteousness and justice? How can you have righteousness and justice if there is no set of laws to begin with? There must be something there. That's why I said at least parts of, I don't know if the entire body of law was there, but at least parts of it was there and known to the patriarchs. The concept of clean, unclean couldn't possibly be Jewish because Noah, a man who existed centuries before there was ever a Jew or an Israelite, being righteous, knew about the clean and unclean animals. Yahweh clearly marked the animals at creation so that men could distinguish between the clean and unclean animals. And you can see when Yahweh tells Noah, Go, you and all of your household, into the ark, for I have seen your righteous before me in this generation. From all the clean animals you might must take for yourself, and from the animals that are not clean you must take so if there is no law about clean and unclean, how would Noah know 
which animals are clean and unclean? So the answer then must be that this is not a Jewish law because it existed from the time of Noah. Where were Yahweh's statues and his laws in the day of Abraham? Why did Yahweh destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there was no concept and no precept against doing such wickedness? Where was the standard of righteousness when Yahweh destroyed the whole world except Noah and his family? So as I showed you before, you have judgment. Just reverse engineer it. If you have judgment, that means you had either righteousness or sin, which means you had free will, which means you had a law. So how can Yah punish? Think about it. He destroyed the entire world. How can it be more judgment than destroying the entire world except for eight people? So w would God be that unjust to not give us any laws and then judge us on transgressing laws that he never gave us? We have to have laws in order to be judged on them. In addition to Noah and Enoch being righteous, Abraham was also considered righteous by Yah. And here is two verses about Abraham. And I know that some people were always thinking that Abraham didn't do anything. Yah loved him and considered him righteous, but he didn't have to do anything other than just have faith in Yah. That's not true. Abraham had faith and actions. And let's look at it. Genesis eighteen nineteen. For I have chosen him that he, Abraham, will command his children and his household after him that they will keep the way of Yahweh to do righteousness and justice. So not only Abraham knew the way of Yahweh, he was commanded to pass it to his children. And then in Genesis 26, Yahweh is speaking to Isaac, the son of Abraham, and he says, because Abraham listened to my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, my Torahs. Abraham also was aware of the Torah and followed it. And that's why he was considered righteous. Up to now, we see a lineage of patriarchs knowing the law, following the law, being considered righteous, and none of them were, was Jew. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> note that keeping Yah's charge is defined by Yah as keeping his commandments, statutes, and Torahs. We can draw two conclusions from these verses. Righteousness, walking with Yah, keeping Yah charge, lawfulness, and obedience are all one and the same. And then Yah dispenses law, or at least parts of it, to the patriarch. And that was way before the official revelation on Mount Sinai. And then here I gave you a list of more examples of how people must have known parts of the law. If we just look at the book of Genesis, we observe the following. The word sin, which we defined earlier, appears 14 times in Genesis, implying that there were known precepts that were born, right? We, we cannot sin if there is no law. The sanctity of the seventh day and resting literally striking from work on the seven day combined was the first statues known to mankind. Taking someone else's life was known to be a transgression. Corruption of the flesh and violence were also known to be a transgression. Uh, regulations regarding which animals are clean or not clean were also known to mankind. Rules regarding altar construction, fruit of the ground offerings and burnt offerings to Yah were also known to mankind. Consuming blood was known to be a transgression. Uh, the right of circumcision was transmitted to Abraham by Yah to denote his Abrahamic covenant. The sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were obviously a violation of known laws. The only one that is directly elaborated is homosexuality, but they had tons of sins in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why they were punished. Coveting another man's wife and committing adultery were also a non transgression. Not intermarrying with a Canaanite nation was a non statute as well. Idolatry was known to be a sin, and regulation regarding marrying his wife if the brother died childless was already known. So, this is just, just example of a list of rules that were already known before there was a Jewish person. 
ישוע also followed the law. ישוע set an example of what it means to be righteous and be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Through his words, he also reaffirmed specific end of day prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And here from now on, whenever I'm quoting Yeshua, you will see that I'm using the a, a green color code, like this green. Whenever you see, that means that I'm quoting from the Hebrew gospel and I'm translating the Hebrew gospel. So you will see the difference. It's really fascinating. Let's start. So Matthew 5, 16 through 20. I'm going to read it first as it is in English translation and then I'm going to incorporate the, the Hebrew from the Hebrew gospels. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, your good works. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. For I truly say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one tiny letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all takes place. Therefore, whoever abolishes one of the least of these commandments and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps them and teaches them, this person will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness, remember what righteousness is, greatly surpasses the one of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. So now let's go back and look what he says in Hebrew. So he says, do not think that I have come to destroy the Torah or the prophet. He's using the word Torah in Hebrew. I have not come to destroy them, but accomplish or carry out. I'll talk more about the word that he's using in a moment. Accomplish or carry out them. And then he says, until heaven and earth pass away, which is not mentioned in Hebrew at all, by the way. What he says in Hebrew is, until the end of the world, it will not pass. That's what he said, ad sofa olam. We can clearly see that Yeshua had no intention of destroying the law. Far from being antagonistic to the Old, Old Testament scripture, he said he had come to fulfill the law and the prophets and proceed to confirm their authority. Let's look at the word that he used in the Gospel of Matthew, and I have links. Again, just ask me, I'll send you the, the PDF of the presentation. You can click, everything is linked here. So you can click and go and look at the Gospel in Hebrew and a fresh translation of the Hebrew. Yeshua uses the word Torah, which translates into law in English. He also uses the term lemalot, and I wrote it here, lemalot. Uh, which was translated into fulfill in English. The word lemalot appears three times in the Bible. That's it, just three times. In Daniel 9.2, it's translated as to accomplish. In 1 Chronicles 29.5, it's translated as to consecrate. And in 2 Chronicles 36.21, it's translated as to fulfill, as in to realize or to carry out. I like to look for second and third witnesses in the Bible for anything, even for one little word. Note that the word mil'u, which comes from the same root as lemelot, and is used more than 40 times in the Bible, means to fill or to follow holy. Follow holy, I think this is what Yeshua meant. I came here to holy follow the Torah. To be an example to all of you, to some of you that think that are following the Torah but are not doing it from the heart. That's what he was telling the Pharisees. What did he have against the Pharisees? They followed the law, but it was more mechanic. Mechanic. It didn't come from the heart. It didn't come from love of Yahweh. Okay? In Numbers 32.12, I'm giving you that word. And Yah is talking to Moses. And he say, he's basically condemning the entire generation 
of the Israelites that didn't trust him and didn't want to go to Canaan to 40 years in the desert. And he says the only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua bin Nun, because they followed Yahweh holy. Okay, that's the word that he is using. Since when following holy, accomplishing or fulfilling means cancelling, destroying, and abolishing. Yeshua was very clear. Righteousness is obedience to the entire law, is being called great in the kingdom of heaven. Then I added here about the Sabbath. In Mark 2.27, he said to them, the Sabbath was established for men and not men for the Sabbath. Some only like the second part of the statement, not men for the Sabbath. But what about the first part? The Sabbath was made for men. By some interpretation, they would have to correct Yeshua and tell him he should have said the Sabbath was not made for Jews, but Jews for the Sabbath. But this is not what Yeshua said. His statement is backed up by scripture. We do wonder how many people honestly believe the following scripture also. Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all under all one in Christ Jesus. Many like to quote this scripture as proof that they don't they don't need to keep the Jewish laws. But if anything, this scripture will declare that they must be one and the same with all Jews in Yeshua. If we are to believe what Galatians 3.28 says, we cannot say that Yah holds one standard for one race of people and another standard for another race of people. This is not true. Yah law was never meant to be double-sided. This is from Isaiah, I just, it's a beautiful uh, prophecy. So Isaiah 56, 1 through 7, that says Yahweh, observe justice and do righteousness. Do righteousness is being obedient. For my salvation is close to coming and my justice to being revealed. Happy is the man who does this. And the son of humankind who keeps hold of it, who keeps the Sabbath so as not to profane it, and who keeps his hand from doing any evil. And do not let the foreigner who joins himself to Yahweh say, Surely Yahweh will separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, Look, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh, the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, and choose that in which I delight, and who keep hold of my covenant, and I will give them a monument and a name in my house and within my walls, better than, the, than sons and daughters. I will give him an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to become his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath so as not to profane it and those who keep hold of my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will make them marry in my house of prayers. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. So there are not two standards in the Bible. There is only one standard of righteousness for everyone. And then in Exodus, he says, one law will be for the native and for the alien who is dwelling in your midst. In Numbers, he says, there will be one law and one stipulation for you and for the alien dwelling among you. These scriptures prove that Yah's law endures forever and is intended for all who choose to join themselves to Yahweh not just Jews. So in summary, there is only one standard of righteousness in the Bible weaved seamlessly and consistently from the days of Adam to the days of Yeshua, and it is obedience to Yah's law. Righteousness existed well before the law was formally transmitted to the Israelite directly by Yah on Mount Sinai. Commandments, statutes, and law existed long before there was ever a Jewish person Whoever follows Yah's way is righteous. That includes Enoch, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, as well as Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, Elijah, and the prophets. Although Jewish people followed the law, 
at least some of them, the law is not Jewish. Yahweh's law endures forever and is intended for all who choose, who choose to join themselves to Yahweh, not just Jews. Yeshua was very clear, righteousness is obedience to the entire law. It's equal to being called great in the kingdom of heaven. And furthermore, and here I, I went to the book of Revelation in Hebrew, the transcript in Hebrew, verse, chapter 2, verse nine, 9. In English it says, synagogue of Satan. Remember, it's pretty famous verse where it says, synagogue of Satan, when he talks about the Pharisees. In Hebrew, he actually says children of Satan. I just wanted to connect because remember I told you, remember the word children of the devil. And the children of the devil are those that are not obedient to Yah, that don't follow Yah's law. So now you see that Yeshua is calling them also children of Satan, children of the devil. This is the Mosaic covenant. Basically, this is the covenant that Yah ratified with the Israelites. He ratified it twice, one on Mount Sinai and one the second time was just before they entered the land of Israel. So I'll try to do it as quickly as possible because I can spend hours just on the covenant. So let's see. So the covenant, a covenant is a binding agreement or a contract. So it's basically a contract. There are several distinct covenants with Yahweh in the Tanakh, in, in the Bible, including with Noah and all human, humanity, with Abraham and his descendants, with the people of Israel through the giving of the Torah, with Aaron and his priestly descendant, and with David and his royal house. I just want those of you that are new to this, I want you to keep in mind that the, the, the word Israel is a title. I know that we have the nation of Israel. I know that we have the children of Israel in the desert. But Israel is a title that unfolds in it all of the people that choose to attach themselves to Yahweh. So the fact that you were born in I don't know, in Oklahoma, and was raised Baptist doesn't mean anything. You can still be a part of Israel, okay? It's a title. The Mosaic Covenant was ratified during the revelation on Mount Sinai and then renewed on the other side of the Jordan in the land of Moab, just prior to the Israelite crossing the river into the land of Canaan. It embraces three areas, civil, ceremonial, and moral. The commands in these three areas were incumbent upon Israel, not only in the letter, but also with a spirit of unfeigned love and devotion. And what I mean here is it has to come from the heart. The first, when he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He says, You shall love. This is how we start. You shall love your God with all of your heart soul with, with all of your might and then when the pharisees or i don't know who asked yeshua what is the greatest law he said the, the, he said there are two of them right you shall love your god with all of your that's the most important we, we cannot be obedient without it coming from the heart from the love that we have for him Okay, so there are five divine promises in the covenant. If we, cho if we choose to join the covenant and be, and, and be obedient to Yah, then we will be considered Yah's treasured possession. And I have references for everything. We will, Yah will define us as kingdom of priests. What does it mean to be a kingdom of priests? What does a priest do? Okay, priest basically is the intermediary between God and humanity, right? For Israel, they had a tribe that functioned as priest, okay? And they, they were the intermediary. They were responsible for all the rituals and worships, but mostly they were responsible for teaching Israel, teaching the law and making sure that they don't forget the law. So if he defines us as his kingdom of priests once we start following him, then that means that we have, it's not just a title or a privilege, we have a duty here to 
be his priest to deliver his teaching and make sure that everyone at least hears the truth and then makes a decision if they want to follow it or not. But that's a huge responsibility to be a priest. The third promise is that we will be considered a holy nation. Holy mean, means that we are separate, right? He is holy. If we are obedient and walking in his way, then we are holy also. And he says, be holy for I am holy. The fourth promise is protection and invincibility. He is going to protect us. And he says it again and again. Things will happen around you, but don't worry. I'm protecting you. And then the fifth one is mercy, grace, and forgiveness. The greatest promise of the Mosaic Covenant is that Yah will treat Israel with mercy and grace and will forgive the people their iniquity, transgression, and sin. And again, it's a contract. So in contracts, you have terms and conditions. And the condition is that we have to keep the, our side of the covenant. So a contract always have terms and conditions. There are five characteristics of the Mosaic Covenants, and I included, again, I comped the Bible, and I, all of the references that you see here, this is a complete list of references for you. So the first characteristic of the covenant is that it's perpetual, it's everlasting, it's enduring. In Hebrew, it's called Brit Olam. It's forever. And there are many verses here. Isaiah, for example, for they have transgressed laws, they have passed uh, by statues, they have broken the everlasting covenant. In Deuteronomy, be careful to obey all of these things that I'm commanding you so that it will go well for you and for your children after you forever. So he keeps using the word forever. This covenant is, for, is forever. It's also whole and complete, meaning he, it's whole. Don't add to it, don't subtract to it. Deuteronomy 12.32 All the things that I'm commanding you, you must diligently observe. You shall not add to it and you shall not take away from it. And I remember as a kid, the first time I read this verse, I teach her, so what is the Talmud? I go to the principal room and I'm punished. And I got punished so many times over trying to understand if we are not supposed to add anything, how come we have the Mishnah and the Talmud? I couldn't understand it. So I got penalized many times for this. But he says, this is whole, don't add and also don't subtract, okay? Don't remove laws. Don't decide that you don't need to for Don't pick and choose. Oh, I'm going to follow this. I don't need, I don't need to follow this law. Faith and works are inseparable and it's very clear. So let's look at some of the verses. And now Israel, what is Yahweh your God asking from you except to revere Yahweh, to walk in all of his ways, which we already explained what walking in Yahweh's way mean and to love him and to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all of your soul. There is the love, but there is also, you have to also do something about it, not just love him. In Psalm 119, it says, remove from me the deceptive way and graciously give me your law. I have chosen the faithful way I have set your ordinances before me. I cling to your testimony. Testimonies, oh Yahweh, do not let me be put to shame. I will run the way of your commands, for you will enlarge my heart. I will heed your law continually forever and ever. It's always faith, believing in him, loving him, but also following his commandments. And the fourth characteristic is that it's conditional. <laughs> Yep, the Mosaic Covenant is based on the faithfulness of both Yah and his chosen people. It's a contract. In contract, we always have terms and conditions. The format is very clear. If you do this, then Yahweh will do that, making it imperative for his people to follow the commands of Yah to obtain promises. The law, as the Mosaic Covenant is often called, impressed three areas, and I already talked about it. 
in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, you can see that following the letter of the law is not pleasing to God. And we saw it also in the, many of the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah, they were talking about people were going through the mechanic of giving sacrifices to Yah. And Yah said, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want it. I want you to do justice. I want you to care for the widow and for the orphan and for the unfortunate and do the right things. Don't just give me sacrifices. And the last thing, it's revealing and veiling. I love this verse. It's one of my most favorite verses and I wish I had remembered it before I, I dove head forward into the black hole called New Age. And it says, the hidden things belong to Yahweh our God, but the revealed things belong to us to know and to our children forever in order to do all the words of this law. So Moses concludes a chapter full of warning to the Israelites to keep their covenant with Yah with those words. It shows a fundamental truth about the Creator. There are things that Yah knows and He does not reveal to us. This is a warning from Moses. We should take great care going outside the scripture, seeking additional revelation. Yeshua himself said that he did not know when he was going to return, but that only the Father knew that. We also see that dying and going to heaven will not mean that we will receive the full revelation of all that is, Yah, that is on Yah's mind. For example, in Revelation 6.10, they called out in loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So no, even when we go to, even if people go to heaven, they still don't know everything. And yet there is much more revealed to us than most believers even dare to take in. I personally, I can read the Bible again and again and Every time I discover new things, every time I, I read a verse and I'm like, wow, how many times did I read this verse? And then all of a sudden something jumped in at me. There is so much revealed to us in the Bible and, and we should really focus on the Bible. But before we start wandering into mysterious fields and then we, and then Satan is waiting there and he's very alluring with his teachings. So hidden things belong to Yahweh our God, but the revealed things belong to us to know. So obedience to Yahweh and his covenant brings blessing, whereas disobedience incurs curses. That's what the covenant says. Israelites were to worship their God by loving him with all their hearts, remembering him and his acts with their minds, and obeying his commandments actively. And there are four basic implications in the book of Deuteronomy that can teach teach us a lot if we take the time reading this book directly rather than relying on someone else's interpretation. So the first one is that forgetting Yah's past faithfulness is actually considered sin. We are commanded to remember. It is important to remember Yah's past faithfulness in order to help one to appreciate his love. This is one of the main reasons we have feasts, because the feasts are helping us focus and remember the past and what Yah did for our forefathers. Yah commanded the Israelites to remember. Forgetfulness was a sin that would lead them to ingratitude and ultimately to apostasy. The second implication is that Yah's laws are an expression of his love for us. Because man is a sinner, he needs divine laws. Yah's provision of these laws is an expression of his love for humankind. Yah's laws are there to keep us safe and bring us immense joy. The third implication, obedience to Yah, demonstrate our love for Him. The decree of our commitment to do the will of Yah is the true measure of our love for Yah. Obedience to Yah can be a joyful or a bitter experience depending on one's motivation. When we know Yah, we love Him, and when we love Yah, we want to obey Him. That's John 14, 15 to 26. The last implication is that consistent obedience is only possible when accompanied by a true love for Yah. Only love for Yah will adequately motivate a person to be consistently obedient to Yah's law. 
While it is possible to obey Yah with lesser motives, it is impossible to be consistently obedient without love of Yah. And that's why, in my opinion, Yeshua said, this is the first law, love Yah. Because if we love him with all of our heart, might, and soul, then it will help us being consistent in our obedience to him. So the laws in Israel were so comprehensive that the only motive strong enough to produce consistent obedience was love. Remember that consistent obedience is not the same as sinless perfection. None, none of us is perfect. So 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They bring joy. Shabbat is one of the most joyful thing. So this is just a summary. Uh, we have five promises in the Mosaic Covenant or the law, okay? And we have five characteristics that we just talked about. And obedience to Yahweh and his covenant brings blessing, whereas disobedience incurs curses. His people were to worship him by loving him with all their hearts, remembering, and his, remembering him and his acts with their mind. Remember not to forget and obeying his commandments actively. So that was about the past and the pres present. What, is, what about the future, right? Some of us were taught that it's going to be canceled, right? And some of us were taught that Yeshua canceled it, right? So let's look at the future quickly. We are going to touch on the new heaven and new earth and a few important uh, characteristics of the future. So Israel will never cease from being his nation. Remember, Israel is everyone that decides to attach themselves to Yah and follow his commandments. So Israel will never cease from being his nation. In the new creation, nations are crafted into Israel. Yah is in all the works and thoughts of future Israel. And then there is a complete harmony between Yah and his followers and complete forgiveness. The past stays in the past. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip reading all of the quotes. Let me continue with both Isaiah and also in the book of Revelation, they were talking about new heaven and new earth. So in the book of Revelation, the new creation is for the righteous ones only. Only the righteous one. And we already de defined what righteousness is being obedience to Yah's law. Everyone else is left outside the gates. Just the thought of being left outside the gates is devastating. That's why it's so important for us to be the nation of priests for Yah, Yah and keep bringing his message. So more and more of us will not stay outside the gates. Everyone will be judged, rewarded, and punished according to their deeds. Again, it's very clear. To be in, you need to perform and not just have faith. Okay, the book of Revelation, that's the last book. That's Yeshua talking to us prophesizing to us about what is waiting for us in the, at the end, the last days. And he's saying that we need to perform, not just have faith. So let's look at Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea did not exist any longer. Behold, the dwelling of God is with humanity, and he will take up residence with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And then I'm jumping. But as for the cowards, and the unbelievers, and detestable persons, and murderers, and sexually immoral people, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their share is in the lake, of burns, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. In Revelation 22, he said, And there will not be any curse any longer, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his slaves will serve him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And then I'm jumping to verse 11. The one who does evil, let him do evil still. And remember who does evil, the one that transgresses the law. That's what Yeshua said. 
and the defiled, let him be defiled still, and the righteous, let him practice righteousness still, practice. And the holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to repay each one according to what his deeds are. To repay each one according to what his deeds are. He didn't say to repay each one to, according to what his faith is. He said to what his deeds are. Those are actions. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are the one who wash the robes so that their authority will be over the tree of life and they may enter into the city through the gates. It's funny that you started with that <laughs> verse. I want to share with you what it says in Hebrew Revelation. So he says, holy are those who follow his commandments. That's what he says in Hebrew. So they will take part in the tree of life and they will have the privilege of or will have achieved walking, living in the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral people and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and who practices falsehood. Practices falsehood. He says in Hebrew, he said, outside stand the dogs and the sorcerers, and the prostitutes, and the murderers, and the liars, falsifiers. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Amen to that. So let's talk about the new covenant, okay? Because some of us were taught that we are already in the new covenant and the new covenant is we don't have to do anything just profess our faith in jesus and we enter the narrow gate even though he said specifically that spacious and broad is the path and still that's what we were taught i'm here to tell you that the new covenant is equal to the torah or law written on the hearts of Israel, his followers, forever. And there is no need for free wills or yacht test anymore. That's the new covenant. Let's read, let's read the description in Jeremiah in, in, in Ezekiel. And this time I'm going to read the entire quote. Jeremiah 31, 27 through 40. Look, the days are coming, declares Yahweh. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Yes, new covenant. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day of my grasping them by their hand, bringing them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they themselves broke, though I myself was master over them, declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my Torah in their inward part and on their hearts I will write it. Aha, so, he's going to, so the Torah is still there. The Torah is not canceled. It's just written on our heart. And I will be to them God, and they themselves will be to me people. And they will no longer teach each other, each, teach each one his neighbor or each one his brother, saying, No Yahweh. Remember, as nation of priests, we are supposed to teach people, right? He says, There will no longer be a need to teach because I'm writing the Torah on the hearts of my people. They will know that no one will need to teach them, they will already know it. For all of them will know me from their smallest and up to their greatest, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will no longer remember. Thus says Yahweh who gives the sun for light by the day, the regulation of the moon and the star for light by night, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar, Yahweh of hosts his name. If these rules would cease from before me, declares Yahweh, also the offspring of Israel would cease from being a nation before me forever. If the heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth below can be explored, also I will reject all of the offspring of Israel because of all that I have done. Uh, they have done. Look, days, days are coming and the city will be rebuilt for Yahweh. It will not be uprooted and it will not be overthrown ag again forever. So he's saying it's impossible 
impossible that the nation of Israel will cease to exist for me. In Ezekiel 36, 26 through 31, he says, and I will give a new heart to you and a new spirit. So that's the same as Jeremiah talking about the new heart. I will give you into your inner parts and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give to you a heart of flesh. And I will give my spirit into your inner parts and I will make it so that you will walk in my rules and my regulation and you will remember and you will do them. So the rules and regulations are not gone. They are still there. They are just written on our hearts. They are becoming a second nature. Okay, I'll stop here. The point is made. The Torah is still there, the rules and regulations are still there, but they are written on our heart. So in summary, the new covenant consists of the same promises. So now it's the new covenant. Yah, treasured possession, kingdom of priests, holy nation, protection, invisibility, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. However, there is no longer a need for if-then terms and condition. There are no longer terms and conditions because there is no need for them. There is no need for if-then conditions and blessing cares consequences as the Torah will be written on the hearts of Israel. This eliminates the possibility of sin and the need for punishment. In other words, these people will still follow the Torah, and is, but this time it will be a second nature or an instinct. Okay, it will be an instinct to us to follow. We will not have to be told about it or uh, make an effort. It's an instinct. Let me repeat this. In the new covenant, the law still holds, but is written on the hearts of God's people, which means that it becomes an instinct rather than a choice. And as a result, sin punishment will no longer exist. So my question is, does that sound like we are currently living under the new covenant? No. And these are some slides about what Yeshua said about the law. Yeshua repeats time and again that loving him is keeping the Father's commandments, no way around it. The Holy Spirit, once residing in his followers, will remind them everything that he said. John 14, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then he said, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commandments and keeps them, that one is the one who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Remember, word means Torah. And my Father will love him, and will come to him, and will take up residence with him. The one who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine but the Father is who sent me. And we know the word of the Father is the Torah. So Yeshua is really clear. I just, when I read this, okay, I, I don't see what's not clear about this. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, that one will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I said to you. We just need to pray again and again that the Advocate will be with us and whisper to us what He wants us to know. When rebuking the Pharisees, Yeshua is pointing to them, lacking both true faith and obedience to the commandments. And He says about them that they neglect more important matters of the law, which are justice and mercy and faithfulness. In Hebrew, He said faith and the commands that are required to do. So he is blaming them that they were actually uh, not following the commandments very well. And he's saying that they appear to be righteous, but they're righteous only outwardly. In Hebrew, we say from the lip out, okay? But inside, they are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And in Hebrew, he said they are full of deception and evil heart. Then he says, how will you escape from the condemnation of hell? Again, Yeshua refers to lawlessness and uh, as broad gate and spacious road that leads to destruction. So in, in Matthew uh, 7, 13 through 14, I want to read to you what he says in Hebrew. He says, enter through the narrow opening because wide is the road that lead men to destruction 
and many enter it, many walk that road. But the gate and the way that lead to life, narrow they are and very few find it. In verses 21 through 23, he says in Hebrew, all those who call me must adorn will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who do the will of my father will enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not enough just to call on the name of Yeshua and call him Adon and you are my master and you are my savior. We have to follow the will of the father and the will of the father is the Torah. And then he says about the people who depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He says in Hebrew, I never knew you depart from me, you evil one full of wickedness. And remember who he refers to as evil one or the disobedient. And last he says, every man who listens to his words and does them. Listen and does, okay? So again, faith and works. Listen and does will be likened to a wise man who found his house on the existing stone. So according to Yeshua, then words without deed, deeds are empty and meaningless and will not award us with entering into the kingdom of heaven. And then the true ministers of Yeshua. So Yeshua's impeccable righteousness, he fulfilled the Isaiah description of the Messiah, namely that the Messiah will judge with righteousness, which is obedience to the entire law. And this this uh, quote from Isaiah really started me on a, rabbit, on a personal rabbit trail of insights and inspiration. But it's such an amazing uh, reference. Let me read it to you. And it's basically about Yeshua. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. And a shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from its roots will bear fruit, and the spirit of Yahweh shall rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and discernment, a spirit of counsel and might, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. And his bread is in the fear of Yahweh. And he shall judge not by his eyesight, and he shall rebuke not by what he hears with his ears but he shall judge the poor with righteousness okay so the messiah himself is going to follow and be obedient to yah and righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins and i always think that maybe that's the verse that inspired paul to write the beautiful uh, paragraph, the, the passage that he wrote about, put on the arm, yeah, armor of God. So the true ministers of Yeshua are then identified by their following the example he left them. In First John, we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. In James, faith apart from works is useless. Faith without works is dead. So the Gospels are replete with statements of our primary obligation for works, obedience, that never once make any statement that the faith and grace that engender salvation occurs apart from obedience. Here is how Yeshua sealed this clear message regarding obedience to the law in Revelation, and that's something else that Paul started with today. And the dragon was angry, so Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was angry at the woman and went away to fight against the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and who hold the testimony about Jesus. So you see how we, the children are those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony about Jesus. So it, it's an in hand, the testimony about Jesus and following the commandments. And in Revelation 14, 12 to 13, he says, the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. Again, faith and keeping the commandments. Revelation 22, I already read that one, where it says, my reward is with me to repay each one according to his deeds. So in summary, Yeshua always upheld the law, the Torah, I don't know why fulfilling somehow became destroying and abolishing, but that's not what he said. 
even some of the occasions when Yeshua seemed to add to the law or teach in new and different ways, he went to great lengths to show that it was based on the Mosaic law. The value Yeshua placed on the commandments of Yah is unmistakable. He met the law's requirements by obeying it perfectly in thought and deed, both in the letter and in the intent of the heart. He required high esteem to the law from all those who teach in his name. His disapproval falls on those who slide the least of the law's commands, and his honor will be bestowed on those who teach and obey the commandments. The last section is, <laughs> I call it, but Paul said, because <laughs> whenever I talk with my friends, I always get this, but Paul said, so I think, as I said, I think Paul, Paul is definitely, when I read Paul, I literally see in front of my eyes a rabbi. Like he's so rabbinical in the way he's thinking. He, he has a very complicated tr thought process. He's brilliant. And he connects dots that no one sees. But I think in the process of connecting dots, many people lose him. And then they take his thoughts out of context and take a word here, a few words there, and then, and then they think that he thought something different. So I just prepared a few slides and we don't have to go in detail, okay? So Paul never thought that the law was abolished, nor had passed away. Very clearly, Paul declared that the law is not abolished or annulled or put to an end by our faith. Romans 3.31, therefore do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be, but we uphold the law. What then becomes the law, Paul concisely stated, we uphold the law, okay? How passionate was Paul about this? How did he respond to an apparent notion that we might misunderstand him or somehow assume that the law might be overthrown or put to an end by our faith? Paul vehemently said, never be a, a far beat or God forbid, okay? I believe that the disconnect in general with Paul is that Paul chastised some believers who try to be justified by keeping the law. We have assumed that he is telling everyone everywhere that keeping the law is by default trying to be justified. This is a, a straw man argument and an utterly false assumption. Paul never thought that the law was abolished nor had passed away. In fact, he just said the opposite, that faith does, not, does nothing to void or abolish the law. I have more verses from Paul, Romans 7, 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Romans 7, 22, for I joyfully agree with the law of God in my inner person. And Romans 7, 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself with my mind am enslaved to the law of God, but with my flesh I am enslaved to the law of sin. Uh, if we pluck out parts of a verse here, half a sentence there from Paul writing without the context, context of the surrounding verses and chapter, we can twist the scripture to our own destruction as Peter warned us. So both Peter and James realized that there is a danger because so many people were misunderstanding Paul. But Paul kept confirming that he is not abolishing or saying anything close to abolishing the law. And let me see if there is the cares thing. Another point that I wanted to make is that when in Deuteronomy, when Yah outlined the covenant, he outlines it in a template. I call it the template of blessing and cares. If you do this, you will be blessed and then tons of blessing. And then if you don't, then this is the cares. He calls it the cares. And I think there is a misunderstanding coming to modern Christianity thinking that law was, uh, that Paul was saying that the law is a curse. No, the law is not a curse, but there is a curse involved if you don't follow the law. In Galatians 3, 10 through 13, he said, for as many as are the works of the law. So he's not saying that the law is a curse. He, Paul knew, he was a he himself was a, a student and a teacher of, of Yah. So he knew that the cares is involved when you break the law. So the words, the law is a cares, do not exist anywhere in the Bible. Verse 10 and 13 of Galatians 
three have been and still are misunderstood and taken out of context. The mainstream theological teaching that the law is the curse is a huge doct doctrinal error that has been passed down from our forefathers. It is heresy. There is not one verse in the scripture to back up this dogma. It is not only heresy, but also blasphemy. The disconnect is this because Paul chastised this one, I, that's the summary, okay. Okay, so my question is what part of forever was abolished at the end of the day? Because we know that the law is forever and I showed you. So what does the text say about the perpetuity of the law? And I already shared with you many verses about the fact that the law is forever. It doesn't say until I send my son or until Paul shows up. It says forever. So is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a liar? That's the question. And we know he is not. He is righteous. Yes, yeah, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he specifically, specifically used heaven and earth as witnesses to the covenantal promises that he made regarding his teaching and instructions. And Yeshua uses also heaven and earth as witnesses. So heaven and earth are still here and there is still much prophecy yet to be fulfilled. The heaven and earth right outside our window do not pass away until Revelation 21. So the law still stands. Last, I just wanted to share this psalm with you. It's a beautiful psalm, 111. Praise Yah, I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart in the assembly of the upright and the congregation. The works of Yahweh are great, studied by all who delight in him. Full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. Yahweh is gracious and compassionate. He gives food to those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has declared the power of his works for his people by giving to them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his precepts are reliable. They are sustained forever and ever, done with faithfulness and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and fearful is his name. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. All who do them have a good understanding. His praise and yours forever. And here I just gave a bunch of resources for Paul's writing. If anyone would like more productive discussion with people about what Paul actually said, these are just amazing articles that shed a lot of light on his writings. Um, and I group them per topic. And then I have designed a handout that has like the major messages and it has only four pages. That's it. And it's really colorful and there are so many references. I actually changed the title to Are We Under the Law or Free from the Law? That's what it says. Um, that's the title. And that's it. Thank you for your patience.